We're absolutely thrilled right now for the first time uh, to introduce to all the Winnipeg Gold Eyes fans uh, someone that uh, many Gold Eyes fans are already very familiar with. Uh, now in the 30th season of the organization, just the fourth field manager in the history of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, uh, one of only six managers in the history of independent baseball with 1,000 plus victories, a three time managerial champion. With the rival Gary Stoucher, Rail Cats, uh, it's our pleasure to introduce here tonight, uh, joining us from his home in Fort Worth, Texas, Greg Taggart, the new manager of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes. Uh, Greg, congratulations on this opportunity. Uh, I know we're all thrilled to have you on board. Uh, thanks so much for coming on here tonight. And uh, just if you can give us some quick thoughts on uh, you now becoming the fourth manager in the history of this organization. Well, Steve, um, just uh, overwhelmed at times. Uh, you know, with everything, I, I think, um, you know, it's somewhat been talked a little bit about, you know, Sam and I and the way it uh, came together, you know, with the job. And and to say that I thought I might be here a year ago talking to you in this role, you know, we've spoken in the past, um, you know, it would have never entered my mind. So I'm, I'm extremely, you know, humbled honored to be a part of you know this organization and and you just discussed steve and talked about and touched upon the 30th season the fact that uh the three prior managers here account for 29 years um unbelievable you know in in terms of any any franchise probably any company and that is uh just a testimony to you know the ownership with Sam and the front office led by Andrew and and everybody that's a part of it and and also a fan base that you know um, it, it, it seems like a, now I'm hoping I read this right but uh, the fan base has always welcomed me very friendly as an opposing team but maybe they did that to all the managers <laughs> but but uh, I, I'm I'm excited to uh, you know be a part of everything. Well, I know our fans are, are absolutely thrilled to to have you on board, and um, you know so much to get to tonight. I, I guess we'll start with something you just alluded to, and that's the not only the continuity of the managers here uh, over the first twenty nine years of the organization, but also the caliber. I mean, starting with Doug Simonick, who won a championship here in Winnipeg in the very first year. I think you and I are both in agreement. He's probably the best ever to do this in independent baseball. Uh, bringing in someone like Hal Lanier, who, who gave the Gold Eyes so much credibility uh, when independent baseball was still in its early stages, uh, someone who had managed in the major leagues, uh, managing in the major league playoffs, and of course just a, a true gentleman and a, a true uh, a, you know master of the game of baseball, and of course uh, someone who I know has become a very, very close friend of yours, uh, really for the better part of the last two decades in, in Rick Forney and everything that uh, he accomplished with the Gold Eyes winning three championships. Uh, uh, just kind of give us your thoughts on... Um, you know, not necessarily following in anybody's footsteps, but, uh, you know, just being part of that group that's, uh, you know, as you said, covered almost three decades worth of baseball. And uh, every one of those three managers that's come before you has uh, brought something very uh, special to the table. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned Doug and and really um, one of the things that I truly value about the independent side of baseball is the relationships that um, get fostered out of it. And you just talked about three men and, and, you know, certainly, you know, Rick and I um, have stayed, even though I wasn't a part of the league last year, we stayed in, you know, close contact. And um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, it goes without saying there was only two teams I was rooting for in the league last year. <laughs> so, you know, my former club and, uh, and the gold eyes and that, that are to tell you, you know, about Rick and I's relationship, but, um, how prior to him, you know, has, has become a, a, a good friend and, and Doug, certainly, um, somebody that I think anybody who manages, you know, I hopefully they, you know, sometimes the history gets lost when, when, um, things change and evolve. But if anybody needs to look, uh, into the history, just to, you know, take a look at who really started this for everybody, all of us, and then set the bar so high. It's Doug, and um, yeah, that uh, the three managers um, certainly the standard, and um, you, you know, following in the footsteps. But I, I just feel like it's right now uh, the responsibility that I have is to continue, um, 
you know, along that legacy and, and providing the Gold Eyes fans and the organization with the kind of quality people and, and team that they're used to seeing. Greg Taggart, uh, just the fourth manager in the history of the uh, the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, again, celebrating their 30th season in 2023, was uh, announced as manager back on December 22nd and was formally introduced at a press conference uh, online last week. So thrilled to have him on the inside pitch here tonight. And, um, you know, I think it's fair to say it, it's not fair to, to you to say that you're following the footsteps of anyone uh, as accomplished as, as you have been for almost three decades uh, managing in the independent leagues. And uh, for, for those uh, fans listening that may not be aware, of course, you're, you're right now most closely tied to, to the Gary South Shirelli Cats and uh, everything you did from 2005 through 2021. Uh, but what some fans may not be aware of is that you're actually um, in affiliated ball last year, uh, coaching, uh, managing in the San Francisco Giants organization, uh, another very storied franchise as far as Major League Baseball goes. Uh, just what can you share about your experiences in the Arizona Complex League and kind of mentoring some of the uh, youngest players that have signed professional contracts and uh, just kind of what that experience was like uh, down there in Arizona last year? No, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, that, the thing about the, the giant situation that was attractive to me is, you know, for some of the same reason, the gold, I was very familiar with the people there, the head of player development, uh, Kyle Haynes, who played for me for a couple of years. I know his family well, his brother, uh, the current, uh, major league hitting coach, Andy Haynes was one of my first coaches in Gary. And, you know, and again, a, a lot of former rail cats dot the, uh, landscape and, you know, for the Giants organization and coaching in various roles. And, and it gave me an opportunity that, you know, at, the, at that stage, my, there was various reasons, you know, certainly there were some personal things that were attractive about the job. I have family in the Phoenix area and, you know, I had, you know, and I don't know if this, I certainly don't want this to come off the wrong way. I had no ambition and certainly don't of, of managing or coaching in the major leagues or moving on to a different, um, affiliate, those kind of things. The Arizona Complex League was a perfect situation for me in the sense that um, you said it best, Steve, you're mentoring young players, 17, 18, 19 years old, um, on a daily basis. They are on the field from morning to night. And in that Arizona heat in the middle of the summer, you know, those players, um, you know, really hone their skills in an environment that, it's probably as beautiful as it is that, you know, it's a little tougher, you know, playing environment than, than many people might realize. But, um, you know, the Giants, uh, you know, because of their philosophy, they, you know, spend a lot of money and a lot of resources into giving their players the best environment. And certainly the Scottsdale facility that we were at um, provided everything you needed from a coaching standpoint, playing standpoint, and treated very well. But, um at the end of the day, you know, I, I certainly, you know, missed what I was doing for a long time and, and something that I identify with very closely and the baseball part of things that, that I miss. But as we've talked about and alluded to, it was really um, the difference maker for me was, you know, the fact that the, the Gold Ice people are, are somebody that I hold in the highest regard and, and have built some relationships over the years. Yeah, and that's a, that's an excellent point. Again, Greg Taggart, the new manager of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, our, our guest here tonight on the inside pitch. And you know, not only has there been the continuity with the managers, just just three managers uh, in the first 29 years of the organization, but uh, you look at the continuity in the front office. Uh, uh, Sam Cates has been the owner since the very beginning of this organization. Uh, Andrew Collier, the longtime general manager, has been with the organization uh, since the very beginning in 1994, and uh, numerous other employee, uh, employees, whether they're uh, full-time in the front office or uh, if they work on game days you know, during the season, that uh, they've been there uh, for 20-plus for years. Uh, just kind of take us through how this sort of, of came about um, you know, the announcement came in late October uh, that Rick Forney was, um, you know, going to take this role here in the Atlantic League with the York Revolution. We certainly wish him and his family nothing but the best. And uh, I think if we all uh, know Rick at all, that uh, we know he's going to be very successful as the manager of the York Revolution. But uh, just kind of walk us through the process from, um, you know, I guess the timeline of, of Rick making the announcement that he was stepping away and uh, ultimately uh, the Gold Eyes announcing you as the manager there on December 22nd. Yes, you know, Steve, and, and uh, you touch upon the fact that, 
you know, real quick on Rick, uh, the, the Atlantic League uh, managers and other teams have their work cut out for them. I know that <laughs> for a fact. Um, you know, it doesn't take long for Rick to, to be motivated for a season and anything new, and, and I, I wish him all the best. I And I know for him um, the decision was extremely difficult, and, and certainly you guys know better than I and Sam with his relationship with everybody there, and, and especially with him and Sam. Um, and it's something that probably over the, the last couple of years had um, become more and more apparent that maybe he, he might do that, you know, down the road. It, you know, I was surprised uh, when I heard it was happening, you know, at that stage. And I, and I guess within probably 10 to 14 days after the announcement, you know, Sam, I, I received a call from, from Sam and, and uh, my cell phone and, you know, that, 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 you know, and, but knowing what the situation was, I, as I may have mentioned a couple of times that I really thought he was calling to ask me for, you know, my thoughts on some guys that applied and I figured former Railcat coaches or, you know, individuals maybe had applied for it. And, you know, that there's, there's no doubt, uh, not only myself, you know, what everybody in the industry identifies with Winnipeg and the gold eyes. You talk about signature franchises, you know, and, and they are certainly one of them and, or we are, I, I, <laughs> I very good used to saying. And, um, so from then I, you know, at first, uh, it was probably awestruck a little bit. I think Sam, if, if I'm correct in the sense, you know, he, he may have mentioned, I, I want to quote him almost, you know, verbatim that, uh, after you pick yourself up off the floor, <laughs> great. We can discuss it. So he knew it, um, surprised me somewhat and you know and I took a couple of days I did not think it you know could happen and you know I was um had every intention of heading back to you know Scottsdale and and doing the same uh job I had done with the Giants and really had, you know when I left Gary um I, you know in a situation you're comfortable with for a long time and 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 you know Steve it becomes really a part of you. And, and I think, um, and some people may know that, you know, the Railcats were such a big part of my life that we relocated the entire family there for about 10 years, um, about uh, part, part of the way through my tenure. And so we lived right in Northwest Indiana, right outside of Gary. And, and um, so it became really our home, not just the second home. It became our home. And, and um, when I left uh, and decided to make the move, you know, just about almost a year ago to this day, I think it was late January, and that was a tough, tough call to make uh, to the Railcats owner and and to somebody we'd been a part of that I was leaving, and um, you know, I, I did not anticipate uh, returning to uh, this side of things or you know in, in this part of the the game, but um, but as I said, it um, it moved forward and. Sam and I uh, exchanged voice calls, emails, few texts, and and um, and here I am. You know, you maybe more than any manager in, in the history of, of independent baseball um, really embrace the, the the bigger picture, the the history. You use the word legacy before, whether it's referring to the great success the Railcats have had or the great success that the Gold Eyes have had here. For almost 30 years, um, just kind of tell us how important that is for you. Just to kind of look back and some of the great individual teams or individual player accomplishments in an industry where the, the tapestry is, is as rich as any other sports league, you know, in, in the last century of, of pro sports, r- regardless of what sport it is. Especially when you go back to 1993, and there were a lot of naysayers that that didn't give independent baseball a chance, or in some cases even wanted to see independent baseball fail and yet here's this industry you know more than 30 years later and you have the the Fargos and the Winnipegs and the Garys and you know the Somerset some of the great frontier and Atlantic League teams that continue to thrive uh just can you can you kind of put that in perspective of what that means to you yeah you know um Steve and, and I think you said it exactly right and it's somebody I you know there's a couple of books out there and 
and certainly Miles Wolf, um, who was on the ground floor with this, along with some other people that um, really, and I'm not sure when the idea is hatched, you know, originally, whether it was 1991, 92, you know, when Miles was the commissioner, I loved to listen to him talk about it and, and the pride that, um, and I think that's really the word I could say that it, it wasn't, I don't think it was ever meant to be a situation where, hey, we're going to compete against Major League Baseball. I, I think it was a situation where, you know, these gentlemen got together and they wanted to offer something that was communities underserved and, and you know, there was no shortage of players, Steve. There's, there's really never been a shortage of good players. I think that's, to this day, one of the things that still surprises me is, is that when I hear people say, uh, you know, the league's better now than it used to be, or it's, you know, or, you know, it's not as good as it used to be or something like that. Or there's no, you just look back at the history and look at the names and the players that have come across. And I'm not talking about just the Daryl Strawberries of the world or, you know, the Jack Morrises, but when they started the Northern League in 1993, it was really a situation where they could go into some cities that no longer were able to have minor league baseball, or professional baseball. And it was really for the communities. And uh, it had nothing to do with, oh, we can provide players to Major League Baseball. That was never part of the equation. It's funny how it gets lost over the years, what the mission and the objective was. And then um, I think what caught people by surprise a little bit in those early years, and I was fortunate to be able to hook onto the Frontier League at that time, which, you know, had started about the same time as the Northern League but was at a, at a much smaller scale. And but what may have surprised you was how in the competitiveness nature took on from the baseball side. And, you know, we mentioned Doug Seminick and some of the early managers and the owners that were a part of it. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, a franchise like Winnipeg comes in and Fargo comes in. And really it changed the whole landscape of, where it was going to go and you know there's there's certainly been challenges and pitfalls over the last 30 plus years i've been a part of a couple of those franchises that were constantly moving you know in the frontier league i was in four different cities in four years because we had to keep moving to the next location i think all of that is just a a wonderful journey for me that um you you fall in love with the idea of it and really, um, you know, if anything, I'm still sensitive to, you know, the uh, the questions over the years of, you know, um, hey, what is this? You know, is this? It surprises me to this day when there's people in the baseball industry that, uh, you know, aren't familiar with what what has happened over the last 30 years. Greg Tagger joining us from his home in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, in the first segment of the show tonight, talked about uh, kind of the history of independent baseball and Greg's perspectives on uh, joining the, the great group of managers that the Golden Eyes have been fortunate uh, to have lead the team here over the last 30 years. Uh, let, let's kind of get into some of the more uh, specifics, your uh, managerial tendencies, philosophies, uh, maybe your thoughts on the Winnipeg Golden Eyes roster, but uh, it, it's just unbelievable how this worked out. But uh, first, I want to get your thoughts. Your first game that you're going to manage for the Gold Eyes <laughs> is going to be against the Rail Cats at U.S. Steel Yard, a place where maybe someday you could very well have your number retired. Uh, just your thoughts on that being your first game managing in Winnipeg. Um, Steve, I'm, uh, I wasn't sure that we'd get touched upon. because, <laughs> And I'll have to say that, you know, in the process, the schedule was released, you know, prior to Sam and I ever coming to agreement. You know, I, I'm guessing the schedule was probably made in October. So unless Josh Buckholtz and Josh Schaub, um, the president and commissioner had an eerie sense <laughs> that, uh, you know, was a t twist of irony, but it's certainly, um, I'll be honest with you. When I, when I just happened to glance at the schedule that I received on my updates, my American association updates, and you know, the job had not been, um, finalized by any means. I thought I said to my, are you kidding me? 
it was um no uh, like i said it's it's one of those things that it will be new to me um uh, i'm trying to think i'd have to go back it's not the first time you know i spent four years with the otters in evansville um probably may talk about some teams that the fans are are not aware of but i, I spent four years with the otters in evansville a, a very storied franchise there that really gave me my first although i had managed a year before that in the front chili this was really the my first chance to manage a club that would be similar to many of the clubs we see today and after leaving evansville i joined a a club that was in transition the dubois county dragons and and certainly going back to evansville for the first time was uh you know a little heartfelt and and um I'm sure there will be, you know, those feelings as we as we go into Gary, but um, but I'll be looking forward to it. And and certainly, you know, uh, leaving on the terms I did, you know, with the decision, you know, everything is is very good there. I stay in touch with with many um, with many people there and have some very fond relationships. Greg Taggart, our, our guest tonight on the first edition of the Inside Pitcher on CJNU 93.7 FM. Uh, uh, the, the track record, unbelievable. And, and you know, we've talked a little bit tonight about the Frontier League. And, uh, you know, something else that maybe fans may not be aware of is that you were, you were the winningest manager in the Frontier League upon taking the, the rail catch job in 2005. And that was a, a distinction that stood for, for quite some time, even after you were well into your, your tenure with the rail catch. So your success, you know, predates the time in Gary South Shore, but uh, you are certainly very well known for what you accomplished with the Railcats uh, right off the hop winning the championship in 05. Uh, I believe it was a stretch of uh, at one point five straight years you went to the Northern League Championship Series, uh, six straight years going to the Northern League playoffs, and of course a very um, memorable, maybe improbable championship in the American Association in 2013. Uh, you were known maybe for, for doing some things a, a little bit differently, and I know a lot of that was was dictated by the dimensions and, and the wind conditions at, at U.S. Steel Yard, or maybe you, you just couldn't build uh, a team around power hitters the way that maybe the Gold Eyes or the Red Hawks or the Saints did with great success uh, uh, throughout their history. So uh, just kind of get your thoughts, on, and maybe you can elaborate on uh, why your teams maybe looked a specific way and were still very successful in Gary, and uh, uh, what you maybe see uh, your philosophy being here with the gold eyes when you're playing in a, a much more neutral ballpark. You know, Steve, um, and that's one of those things that I think you, gets discussed a lot when you're talking about different styles and, and different managers. You might, um, you know, the small ball versus, you know, the other way around it. And, you know, you, you wait for the three run home or some of those cliches or, you know, terms that you hear talked about a lot, but, I, I don't know if I ever believed in, you know, build a book club to your ballpark. And that was never the intention in Gary. And and quite frankly, when I started there in 05, had never watched a game there, never been there. And the players that really, you know, when, you know, we came in and had the, the success we did for that long stretch of time in the Northern League before we, went over to the association um, had, had nothing to do with the ballpark. Now it certainly over the years started to play to our advantage, but more so because of the opponent, um, the frustration and, and um, you know, it, it, without a doubt until the changes that they made prior to 2021 with the stadium, I, I think we'd all agree. Um, and you were a Wichita team that, um, could, you know, out hit anybody that I've seen in two in in the thirty years, you know, close that I've been. But you put them in Gary, and it changes from a mental standpoint. I think it helped us more from that side of things, because what we were able to do, especially with our better ball clubs and some of the players that we had over the years, then when we when we would go into other ballparks, our hitters almost had a renewed sense of energy and confidence you go into some of the places especially some of the hitters friendly places like a kansas city you know a sioux falls some of those places you know some of the other early places or some of the east coast places when we used to go to the east coast and i always found that was really the advantage it wasn't tailored to how we played at our ballpark 
as much as it was, it worked to our advantage. Stephen, I'll point out, you know, when somebody would recommend a pitcher to us and Gary and say, hey, he'll do well in your ballpark, I usually stayed away from that guy because that meant he wouldn't do well in those other ballparks. And, you know, so we, uh, we really tried to tailor our ball club just on the talent level. And I think any manager has a player profile that fits him. And maybe that's more so what, for me, you know, uh, if you look at some of the, the great players, and I'll go with some more recent names, but, you know, Mike Massaro, Adam Klein, Alex Crosby, some names like that I'll try to get a, not as dated, um, you know, as I get sometimes. But uh, they, they fit a profile, and they're very similar players, even going back to our early years in Gary. And I think that's with any manager. It's not so much the style of play. Now, you know, will we uh, attempt to sacrifice bunt more than some other clubs? I think it depends on, you know, what type of ball club we have, you know, the situation. But we may not do it um, by any, you know, you know, mindset that this is the type of ball club we are. And um, I love the long ball as much as anybody. There's nothing like home. And I've had one of the most prodigious home run hitters that the Northern League of the Association has ever had in Christian Guerrero. And he came through Gary. And, and um, you know, the only thing that maybe hurt him is he might have hit 35 homers in another ballpark. But um, but it's something that that is more the the type of player, a guy that fits. You know, I do put a strong emphasis on on two dimensional, three dimensional players. You know, not somebody that can't play the defensive side of the the ball. Those kind of things. So those are some of the things that I do believe in. And, and I, I remember this clear as day. This is maybe 2015 or, or 2016. I remember you, you telling me exactly what you just said, that you, you love the three-run home run as much as, as any manager out there. It's just, you know, sometimes the, the home run numbers at, at, at the steel yard over the course of the season, I just may not be um, comparable to maybe to some of the other clubs. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're anti-power or anti-home run. <laughs> right. No, it, and no, it doesn't. And, now I'm anti-home run when our pitchers are giving them up. <laughs> I don't want to be clear about that. But uh, no, and and especially um, Steve, uh, with the way the game uh, has evolved, and it's not just in the last couple of years. I think, um, and Steve, is you know, you certainly more than anybody because of how deep a dive you take into the numbers. You know, the power numbers are up everywhere. You know, from the major leagues down to affiliated minor leagues, the independent side of things, college baseball. You watch some of these college baseball games in the last year, you know, the power numbers are up everywhere. Um, the one trade-off seemingly is the ability to put the ball in play and and the strikeouts, which I, I know fans hate just as much as managers do, as much as farm directors, general managers. And I think right now everybody is looking for that perfect balance just like every year you know it doesn't matter what sport it is somebody is looking for that perfect formula how do we accomplish both and um when somebody accomplishes that you know they will be on a long road ahead of everybody else greg tagger joining us on the first edition of the inside pitch here in 2023 uh, of all the things that uh, you and your staff and the players uh, accomplished there in the time of the Gary South Shore Railcats. Uh, th this is one thing that has just always floored me whenever I looked at it. And it seemed like even, you know, whether it was a championship Railcats year or maybe a, a little bit of a down Railcats year, that you guys always excelled in one-run ball games, And uh, the numbers are just staggering. A 564 winning percentage during uh, the 16 years that you were managing the Gary South Shore Railcats, a 564 winning percentage in one-run games. And, and effectively, it's, it's a... a you're doing okay if you're 500 just because anything can happen in a one-run game, a, a bad bounce here or there. Uh, and even good teams typically will finish around that 500 mark. So uh, for you to finish 64 percentage points above 500 uh, over uh, you know a decade and a half in one-run ball games, uh, just a testament to, to the players buying in. And uh, just kind of give us your thoughts on, on, on why you're um, – 
why the players were able to, to, to do that and sustain that type of success in the tightest of ball games for so long. Yeah, you know, I've been fortunate um, to have many players who, you know, we talked about what independent baseball is. And, and Steve, you know, and I think um, all the managers, Rick, George Samus, Joe Cafe Petcher, that, you know, um, Steve Montgomery, you know, Mike might would agree that those type of games, those type of situations, there, there's a lot of things that are tough. The travel, everybody, you know, the travel, you know, is difficult. The uh, schedule is difficult. But if you have a club that buys into, hey, the team winning is important. And, and I've been very fortunate uh, that, that we, for the most part, over the years, had those type of players I have and and I think it is invaluable in those kind of situations. And from a baseball standpoint, one of the things I do believe makes a difference in one run games is is what I mentioned before is if you don't sacrifice too much on defense, even though you may have to for the offensive side of things, I think it's those times you can win those one run games if you've got two or three better defenders than the other team. And, and I really do believe that makes a difference. Now, whether that makes a difference in every game, probably not, because one of the things we just talked about, the long ball, you know, your pitching staff, you know, how deep can they get in a ball game? How many, you know, runs are you going to have to play from behind sometimes? But in those tight ball games, extra inning games, you know, the defense, the ability to catch the ball and not make mistakes, um, and, and, and not just the, the positions that we all consider important in catcher, shortstop, center field. I'm talking about the other ones, your, your first baseman. You know, I was there, you know, a long time ago, back in 2005, I, I made it, hey, we, we can't give up anything at first base defensively. And I've always believed in that. And, you know, and then I started to transcend that to other positions where I felt like, okay, you know, why do you need to put a bad defender in left field? You know, it's, you know, that's why they invented the DH, we hope, you know, for the players. But, um, but I do think all of that makes a huge difference in the one-run games. But it starts with that player's mindset. You know, does he really thrive in this environment where, you know, at the end of the day, yes, the player wants to get to the big leagues. I, I have no doubt about that. I, I, I want every player that ever managed to make it to the major leagues, I, it, you know, and, and that's certainly their ultimate goal. But when they're playing for the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, I want their ultimate goal and, and their focus to be on us winning because that's what those fans care about. That's what uh, the owner cares about. And, and that's what um, I hope everybody does when they're playing that game. You know, you, you said something uh, really interesting during the, the press conference last week about how, you know, you felt like you never – had a one, two, three, ninth inning in a close game when you're managing the Railcats because of how intense the, the crowds were here in, in Winnipeg night in and night out. And it was just never easy, even if you did end up uh, finishing things off and, and coming out on the right side of the scoreboard. But uh, it's interesting because I, I would imagine every other team and manager uh, that's played the Railcats over, over the last 15 plus years would say the same way, whether it's uh, at, in their home ballpark or certainly at U.S. Steel Yard, that uh, they never seem to have a a one, two, three, ninth inning in a close ball game, and, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the term that uh, some have attributed to Doug Simonek, some have referred uh, uh, attributed to the uh, the great radio broadcaster of the of the Gold Eyes in Paul Edmonds. But uh, the idea of getting rail catted in the eighth or ninth inning when just something happens, an error, maybe you don't turn a double play, a, a two out walk, that things just kind of unravel, and all of a sudden. The Railcats end up sneaking by you late in the ball game. Uh, just uh, when did you first become aware of that term? And uh, just from from not only yourself but also a lot of the players I've talked to over the years, um, whereas the other teams maybe use that as a term of derision, you guys kind of wore that as a badge of honor. <laughs> yes, um, you know, if I recall correctly, you know, in 2006 was the first time I heard it, um, and whether it was Doug Al Gallagher, you mentioned Paul. Uh, you know, it, it somewhat became synonymous and, um, and it was, you know, we took it as a term of endearment so much that it appeared on some championship rings for guys and, 
and you know adorn the clubhouse wall and and those kind of things and and um you know so it became somewhat of a, a rallying cry and over the years you know as players change and and things like that and and sometimes it really was a, a part of our identity for a long and I, I think continued for the most part and you know as, as I said you know it seemed like the um, and for everybody, even even the teams that did play, you know, the Gold Eyes in 2020, it seems like the pandemic almost made everybody restart in 21. And so, you know, I'm not so sure if it's continued. You know, I, as with any new manager and, and that comes in and puts a stamp on the ball club, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it continues today. But those guys from, um, you know, the Jay Pesci's and the Willie Glenn's and the Steve Hawkins and the Tanner, they will, um, you know, be listening to a ball game, and, and they'll use that phrase 15 years later, and at any time. So it was, it was really, you know, something that we were, we took a lot of pride in. Shout out! I always enjoy hearing you talk about that. Uh, we're going to take a break and uh, come back with our final segment and close things out with Greg Taggart, the newest manager. Of the Winnipeg Gold Line. Greg Tagger joining us for the entirety of tonight's show. We'll close things out here and uh, talk a little bit about the Winnipeg Gold Eyes roster. Uh, have a nice foundation here coming in, a, a club that made the postseason a year ago, a, a record setting year uh, with Max Murphy and David Washington, each eclipsing the 30 home run mark. Uh, some nice pitchers, both in the rotation and uh, in the bullpen uh, to build off of. I know there have been a couple of transactions that have come across the docket here recently with uh, players that have expressed interest either in retiring or maybe playing closer to home. But, uh, you know, how, how much have you uh, kind of dived into the Winnipeg Gold Eyes roster since taking over? What kind of communication have you had with the players? And uh, just uh, generally speaking here, as we're still fairly early in the offseason, uh, where do you think the roster kind of stands right now with the players that are still there uh, that finished with the team in 2022? Yeah, Steve, um, you know, right when, even before taking the job and, you know, before uh, finalizing everything with Sam, one of the first things when you get your mind racing on whether this could happen or not, um, I think I probably share the same sentiment that other managers would. I, I jumped right into that roster. And there's a few familiar names. Of course, you mentioned Max and and the year he had was incredible and you know, I was uh, able to see him in St. Paul firsthand. Kevin Lachance, a, a wonderful player who, you know, we saw early in his career, you know, from the gold eyes. Uh, you know, very familiar with David Washington, who, um, you know, as a free agent, looking at all his options, you know, somebody that we would love to have back, who wouldn't? Um, but, yeah, you know, as always, Rick's roster uh, put together extremely well. And, and you know, in players – you know, just the nature of independent baseball, and it's probably even more so in in today's world and today's society, and and over the last couple of years, how things have changed, um, the responsibilities that everybody has at home, whether it's financially, uh, family. I, you know, what I've seen over the last few years, um, and even not being a part, of it, is the movement of players. Um, and for some of the reasons you just talked about and, and, you know, players looking at opportunities outside the U S and, and players looking for any other, you know, one of the things I do notice and, and Steve, you can probably, um, you know, give some input on this one. If, and then maybe this is just that perception. That's not reality is that there are players playing additional years longer than ever, or maybe trying to make a comeback. Um, one of the players we mentioned, Paul Schwindel, who has announced his intention to retire, who came back after a few year hiatus and really put himself on the map, you know, coming back uh, and restarting his career. I think you see a little bit of that. Um, the young players, again, you know, Rick signed uh, a number of very good young players that, you know, from Landon Barossa to, you know, John Vargas, you know, the young player, the young left hander, Alex Hart. But um, there's some wonderful, wonderful uh, additions on that roster. Um, Hideko Gonzalez, who you and I have talked about, um, you know, from a defensive standpoint, who has a chance to really mature into an all-around frontline catcher, I think. So 
And, you know, as the changes, you know, there will be changes with any roster, you know, with that normal attrition and, and movement. And, and, you know, I've spoken to um, virtually everybody, you know, either via email, text, phone call, you know, still a couple guys that were trying to connect, um, you know, verbally, you know, through the, through the, um, the telephone or what have you. But, um, and, and again, I want to make sure we, do everything we can with the gold eye group that was there in 2022 before too much, uh, on the new things, new side of things start. And this is something that I know is extremely important to, to Rick, uh, in, in building a, you know, a clubhouse culture. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that it definitely translated over, um, you know, the success the teams had on the field. And I know this is very, very important to you as well. Uh, not only trying to find the best players, but, uh, the right fit, whether it's the the right fit in Gary, the right fit in, in a Winnipeg, um, just kind of your thoughts on the importance of of clubhouse cohesion, and in addition to having very good baseball players, and and uh, your philosophy in that in general. Yeah, you know, um, Steve, I I think that's one thing that um, Major League Baseball could probably borrow from the independent side of things is how important that is. And and how much it relates to winning. And I'm not just talking about major, you know, whether it's the NFL, you know, what have you, the NBA. It, it doesn't mean that every player has to be the best friend of the other player. But that word respect, um, teammates have to respect each other. Um, and, and not every player is going to, you know, love Greg Jagger as much as they did Rick Forney, vice versa. You know, I've got some guys from their Gary days who, you know, we'll set that, you know, we've got uh, three big dogs here and two of them are named after former players. So, um, you know, just uh, those relationships you build over the years. But I think it's important to each of it, and it's different than what we discussed earlier about the player profile. You know, hey, I want to switch hitting second baseman. That, that's a little different than what we're talking about here. And, and each manager, you know, defines it. I think when that player walks in and how he interacts with everybody from, you know, the clubhouse staff, the front office, the bus drivers, the radio people, his teammates, and um, you're always wanting that total package. And, and um, you know, and certainly, uh, you know, we're all, you know, guilty at, at, at many times of uh, not being the best person we can be. And, but um, but you hope that uh, it, it, it's a wonderful fit for the ball club and that the fans are very proud of who they're watching. I, I can't overstate that enough. I, I want the fans to come to the ballpark and, and just uh, really bond with the ball club. And, and I know for the most part what I've seen in Winnipeg over the years, that has been the case. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of fly by here tonight. We could probably talk with you uh, for, for hours here about uh, the Gold Eyes and the American Association and independent baseball. But uh, it's been a blast having you on this first show. Just kind of before we let you go, and um, you know, this will be the first of eight shows we'll have you on leading up to the start of spring training. Uh, just any uh, last words you might have for uh, Gold Eyes fans tuning in tonight and uh, hearing you for the first time? Well, Steve, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, um, day one up there for spring training. I know we get a couple of days before we head on the road in spring training. And, um, you know, I've, uh, already started the idea of, um, you know, getting my wife up there and, and being a part of, uh, the community just like Rick was, I hope. And, and, you know, I, I just, um, looking forward to everything that, uh, that I've seen over the last 17, 18 years as a visitor. And, um, been treated so well and and certainly um i'm looking forward to it well outstanding stuff uh, i appreciate you taking the time out i know it's a kind of the time of the year where things begin to get busy for the independent managers and uh just have always had a great time talking american association baseball with you i know the fan base is super excited to have you on board uh the, the front office is excited to have you on board and uh we're just looking forward to uh having a lot of fun here this summer so thanks so much for taking the time out and uh, just uh, looking forward to a great 2023 season. Thank you, Steve. My, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance to do a few of these with you over the years on the other side of things, you know, um, as, as a guest on the radio. So this uh, 
certainly was something I was looking forward to, and I will every, every week we do it, and, and it, it'll make the uh, off season pass a little faster. <laughs>